It's like a frog meeting a snake and waiting for the snake to eat him. The Battle of Okinawa. Americans know it as the Typhoon of Steel. The Japanese called it Tetsu no Ame, the Rain of Steel. The battle was the bloodiest in the Pacific Theater during the Second World War costing the United States more than 49,000 casualties, including U.S. Ground Forces Commander, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr. The Japanese losses were even greater, with over 110,000 killed. Local Okinawans suffered the greatest, with an estimated 150,000 killed. Between 1 April and 22 June 1945, American sailors, soldiers, marines, and airmen battled against determined Japanese troops in subterranean networks, kamikazes from the air, and suicide naval attacks in what would be considered a precursor to the concept of multi-domain operations, or MDO. American planners predicted that the Japanese would fight fiercely for Okinawa, and indeed they did. The Japanese forces needed to hold Okinawa long enough for Japan to mobilize its defense of the mainland. The Americans needed to seize Okinawa in preparation for the planned assault on Japan. U.S. forces would succeed, but only after weeks of fighting the costliest battle of the Pacific War. The ultimate goal of U.S. strategy in the Pacific was the unconditional surrender of the Japanese Empire. In May 1943, the Allied Combined Chiefs of Staff approved the strategic plan for the defeat of Japan. In this plan, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff outlined the need to maintain and extend unremitting pressure against Japan, with a major goal being an overwhelming air offensive. The U.S. dual drive through the Central and Southwest Pacific areas were aimed at controlling the South China Sea and securing air bases in China. But after establishing air bases in the Marianas, General MacArthur's announcement that he could capture Luzon two months earlier than expected and dire estimates of the forces needed to secure Formosa all nullified the desire to capture areas on the Chinese coastline. This ultimately freed up the U.S. Central Pacific forces to concentrate their efforts on capturing a staging area for a possible invasion of the Japanese home islands. The U.S. Joint Chiefs identified Okinawa as the most logical objective to establish this staging area. The decision is ultimately made that Okinawa is not only closer to the mainland of Japan, but it also has lodgements for ships that can be parked, unloaded, uh, and it has the potential for airfields, and it's that much closer to Kyushu and the Japanese defenses that are being prepared at that time. Within six months, U.S. forces gathered off the coast of Okinawa, readying themselves for multi-domain operations. Multi-domain operations are the combined arms employment of joint and army capabilities to create and exploit relative advantages, and achieve objectives, defeat enemy forces, and consolidate gains on behalf of joint force commanders. They accomplish this with four tenets of agility, convergence, endurance, and depth. The U.S. invasion of Okinawa occurred in three phases. Phase one began on 26 March, six days before the main assault by the 77th Infantry Division, with landings on the Karema Islands off the southwest coast of Okinawa, launching Operation Iceberg. Phase one then concluded 
With a demonstration in the south by the 2nd Marine Division, the main landing on Okinawa by the Marines 3rd Amphibious Corps and the Army's 24th Corps, and the subsequent seizure of the airfields at Yantan and Kadena. Phase 2 featured landings on Ieshima and the occupation in Okinawa. Phase 3 involved the seizure of nearby islands. The main landing on Okinawa on 1 April was the largest amphibious assault in the Pacific Theater during the Second World War. On L Day, 10th Army landed on the Hagashi beaches and began to cut the island in two. With a lack of opposition on the shores, 10th Army seized the Phase I objectives of Kadena and Yantan airfields within hours of landing. This permitted U.S. Commanding General, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr., to start Phase II, the seizure of all of Okinawa. The 7th Infantry Division, for example, crossed the island quickly and made it all the way to Hill 165, known as Castle Hill. Planners estimated it would take 10 days to achieve this objective. It had taken only a few hours. Weak opposition and rapid gains encouraged U.S. Commanding General, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr., to proceed immediately with Phase Two of the plan, the seizure of Okinawa. The 6th Marine Division advanced up the Ishikawa Isthmus and by 7 April had sealed off the Motobu Peninsula. By 13 April, the 2nd Battalion, 22nd Marine Regiment reached Hedo Point at the northernmost tip of the island. The Marines had contained the bulk of the Japanese forces in the north. Opposition in the south increased as American soldiers advanced into the interior of the island. The Japanese 32nd Army defended Okinawa. Formed in March 1944 and commanded by Lieutenant General Mitsudo Ushijima, the Army's primary goal was to defend Okinawa and delay the Americans' advance to the Japanese mainland. Throughout the latter part of 1944 and into 1945, Imperial Japanese Headquarters, or IJHQ, constituted and reinforced the 32nd Army on the island. The 32nd controlled six airfields on Okinawa and nearby Ieshima. IJHQ estimated that the United States would advance on the home islands through the Philippines, Formosa, or Okinawa. Japanese planners immediately marshaled ground forces toward each location in hopes of delaying the U.S. advance. Within months, the 32nd Army on Okinawa grew in strength from approximately 14,000 to about 110,000 troops. The main combat units were the 24th Division, a heavy division with organic artillery and three infantry regiments, each with three battalions, the 62nd Division, a light division with two brigades, each with five infantry battalions but no artillery, the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade, and the 27th Tank Regiment. The Okinawa Naval Base Force was also attached to 32nd Army. The Naval Base Force had one torpedo boat squadron, one midget submarine unit, and various coastal defense, engineer, signal, supply, and transportation units normally used to support naval vessels in and around Okinawa. The Army also conscripted local Okinawans for combat and non-combat roles. Male students aged 14 and older were organized into blood and iron for the Emperor duty units and trained for guerrilla warfare. The Japanese were ready to defend the island. Initially, General Ushijima intended to defend Okinawa's beaches against Allied amphibious landings. After learning from their experiences on other Pacific islands, IJHQ urged him to reconsider. Imperial leadership understood Okinawa's strategic value lay in delaying the Americans from reaching the other home islands. One of the narratives that tends to get overlooked in the Pacific War, and I think it's an important one, 
The United States Navy has been conducting a submarine campaign since December 7, 1941. It's an unrestricted naval uh, campaign. And they have done a masterful job of sinking the Japanese merchant fleet. With losing some of his promised reinforcements to submarine attacks, Ushijima concluded that the smaller 32nd Army could not defeat the 10th Army on or near the beaches, but it could lure American forces into more advantageous terrain and a prepared, deliberate defense. Ushijima defended fortified positions in the hills and valleys of southern Okinawa. Colonel Hiromichi Yahara, Ushijima's senior operations officer, described the strategy as attritional, aimed at delaying U.S. forces and inflicting maximum losses in men and materiel. Holding the Okinawa fortress as long as possible would give the Imperial Japanese Army more time to fortify the home islands and prepare for the expected U.S. invasion. The Imperial Japanese soldier was fighting for the emperor and his life had no meaning outside of that of the emperor and he was willing to die in defense of the emperor and the chrysanthemum throne. There's a fundamental difference in the motivation between a Japanese soldier and an American soldier slash marine and how he viewed the worth of his life. For the average Japanese soldier, he's not going home and he knows he's not going home. Ushijima selected the southern half of the island's caves and ridges to defend in depth. The 32nd Army reinforced the limestone and coral caves in southern Okinawa with concrete and wood to create formidable defenses. The 32nd Army also constructed a complex tunnel system throughout the southern half of the island. Like the 14th Area Army had done with Manila's sewers and intramuros on Luzon, the 32nd Army on Okinawa used tunnels and Shuri Castle to assist in operations. Along with the fortified positions, the tunnels served as strong points and formed Ushijima's defense in depth. A strong point is a heavily fortified battle position tied to a natural or reinforcing obstacle to create an anchor for the defense or to deny the enemy decisive or key terrain. The 32nd Army headquarters operated out of a tunnel complex under Shuri Castle. This historic place was the center of the Naha Shuri Yonobaru Line, later known simply as the Shuri Line, and where the bulk of the 32nd Army awaited the American attack. Commanders prepare a strong point for all around defense. Commanders establish a strong point when anticipating enemy actions that will temporarily isolate a defending force that is retaining terrain critical to the overall defense. The Shuri Line was a defense in depth. The Japanese forces defended in depth to absorb the momentum of the planned U.S. attack by forcing the U.S. to attack repeatedly through Japanese mutually supporting positions in depth. In a defense in depth, defending units are arrayed in successive layers of battle positions along likely enemy avenues of approach. On the day of the U.S. invasion, 1 April 1945, Japan's 32nd Army waited for the Americans inland where Japanese troops had prepared an area of defense in strong points and three successive lines, between Futema and Kuba to the north and Naha and Yonobaru to the south. The area defense is a type of defensive operation that concentrates on denying enemy forces access to designated terrain for a specific time, rather than destroying the enemy outright. The focus of an area defense is on retaining terrain where the bulk of a defending force positions itself in mutually supporting, prepared positions. Units maintain their positions and control terrain between the enemy forces and the terrain they desire. Units at all echelons can conduct an area defense. The Japanese 63rd Brigade, 62nd Division, manned the strong points and the first defensive line to delay and attrit the advancing Americans. The division's main effort, the 64th Brigade, dug in on the reverse slope of the defensive lines to destroy U.S. forces. The purpose of a reverse slope defense is to deny the enemy the topographical crest. Although the defender may not occupy the crest in strength, controlling the crest by fire is essential for success. This situation reduces the effects of indirect fire, mortar, 
artillery, and close air support, and draws the battle into small arms range. The reverse slope defense provides a defending force an opportunity to gain surprise. The goal is to make the enemy commit forces against the forward slope of the defense, causing enemy forces to attack in an uncoordinated fashion across the exposed topographical crest. The 24th Division was in defensive positions covering potential landing sites on the south coast of Okinawa. The 44th Independent Mixed Brigade defended south of Yonobaru and on the Chinin Peninsula. The Okinawa Naval Base Force occupied defensive positions on the Oroku Peninsula. These Japanese units and the terrain they occupied formed an extensive series of overlapping and mutually supporting defensive lines. Each area was filled with thousands of bunkers, blockhouses, pillboxes, fortified caves, and tunnels. The defending Japanese forces used subterranean systems to protect critical assets, develop covert programs, and maintain a form of initiative against the more powerful U.S. forces. They also used subterranean locations for command and control, defensive networks, operations, storage, production, and protection. If the Americans were going to secure Okinawa, they needed to defeat the determined and dug in 32nd Army. A critical component of a successful amphibious operation is the security of the fleet while ground forces move inland. The United States Navy, for its efforts, is not only providing air support for ground forces in terms of close air support uh, and those applications, as well as naval surface fire support, the United States Navy is also providing air cover in terms of kamikaze protection. Unfortunately, the longer the amphibious support element must remain on station and in harm's way, the longer the combat forces of the fleet must be in position engaged in the task of covering that element. There is no other support. The Japanese Army and Navy and Air Force is stretched at this point. There is no large-scale air fleet or naval fleet that's going to come uh, save them. And this is a, a bitter pill as uh, some of the Japanese commanders thought that they would get some naval support, but there's nothing there anymore. Indicative of what the Japanese have become in terms of desperation in stemming this American offensive is they sortie their largest battleship, the Yamato, uh, which has basically been sitting portside for most of the war as the Japanese have had a shortfall of fuel oil, ammunition, trained crews. The Yamato really sits as a floating hotel for a large part of the war. But in order to help uh, in the defenses of Okinawa, they will sortie it with the mission of it sailing to the island, beaching itself, and being used as a basically artillery piece. Uh, the Americans are able to intercept it and, of course, through naval aviation, sink the ship before it makes it to Okinawa. But it's indicative of the desperation the Japanese are at. At Okinawa, those combat forces were the fast carriers of Task Force 58, and enemy activity was primarily in the form of suicide attacks. Japan created special attack units that consisted of both air and naval forces, which were manned by airmen and sailors that would sacrifice their lives by directing their aircraft and sea craft to crash into American ships. The most dangerous special attack units were the aircraft from both the Japanese Navy and Army, known as the Kamikaze. Under the Japanese Ketsugo or decisive operations, their mission is to bleed the Americans as much as possible. They know the Americans are casualty adverse and uh, don't have the same ethic in terms of the honor of dying for the emperor or dying for the president in the American parlance. So what they're hoping to do is bleed the Americans as much as possible to get in a, some kind of a negotiated settlement. The kamikazes are part of this. And the way the Japanese conduct their defense of this part of this, every man is expected to give his life uh, for the emperor. And the kamikazes are just the, the latest expression of that. They do cause damage to the American fleet. However, given the size and scope of the American military at this time, it really doesn't make a decisive difference. It makes a psychological difference. And it does play in the minds of naval air crewmen and, and the surface ships themselves. However, the kamikazes themselves are not gonna stem the tide. But again, they're looking to affect the Americans psychologically 
uh, not necessarily uh, materially. With the pilot serving as a guidance system, one could frame IJHQ's kamikaze aircraft over Okinawa as human-guided munitions. These served as a forerunner to modern precision-guided munitions, which are a necessity for the Army's MDO doctrine. They also continuously sent smaller attacks, which kept the U.S. fleet on constant alert. Regular dive bomb and torpedo attacks were also mixed into kamikaze sorties to make them even more unpredictable and deadly. The Japanese executed almost 2,000 kamikaze and hundreds of conventional attacks, which resulted in the damaging and sinking of dozens of U.S. ships. Back on land, the 6th Marine Division cleared northern Okinawa, while the Army's 96th and 7th Infantry Divisions moved across the island and away from the landing beaches. The Army Divisions eventually located the enemy in heavily fortified positions along Ushijima's defensive lines. This extensive interlocking networks of caves and tunnels posed a serious challenge to the Americans. When dealing with subterranean environment, the preferred course of action is to mitigate the underground facility, its portals or its effects, and to continue with the unit's original mission. Several options exist to mitigate the underground facility's effects on mission accomplishment. These options include bypass, neutralize, control, and contain. Additionally, commanders may choose to clear a facility. However, an attack to clear an underground facility may be deemed necessary. The Americans' rapid advance and sweeping gains had come to an end. The 96th Infantry Division encountered fierce resistance from Japanese troops holding fortified positions east of Highway No. 1. On what became known as Cactus Ridge, about 8 kilometers northwest of Shuri Castle, the 7th Infantry Division encountered equally fierce Japanese opposition from a 30-foot coral spire known later as the Pinnacle. By the night of 8 April, American troops had cleared these and several other fortified positions. They suffered over 1,500 casualties in the process and killed or captured about 4,500 Japanese. Yet the battle had only begun, for these were merely outposts guarding the Shuri Line. At the Pinnacle and Cactus Ridge, the Americans faced a situation that was to be repeated many times on Okinawa. The enemy had fortified the coral and limestone ridges and prepared gun positions on the reverse slope of the hills. Using these tactics, the forward units of the 32nd Army stalled the U.S. Army's 24th Corps' offensive for another eight days. The next American objective was Kakazu Ridge, two hills with a connecting saddle that formed part of the Shuri Line's outer defenses. Most of the 96th Infantry Division focused on the ridge line immediately north of Kakazu Village. In the face of concentrated Japanese counterattacks and artillery fire from the reverse slope, repeated attempts on Kakazu Ridge failed, even when supported by joint fires. The 96th advanced no farther than the northeast slopes. It had taken 24th Corps 15 days to seize terrain initially projected to take only five days. Since the landings and phase one progressed quickly, they were only three days behind their earlier projection. Yet the losses were high. By 15 April, approximately 1,200 replacements from 10th Army reached the 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions by way of Saipan. These replacements filled less than half the combined U.S. losses, over 3,000 casualties. After days of little progress and heavy casualties, 10th Army committed its reserve, the 27th Infantry Division, on 9 April. Commanded by Major General George W. Greiner, the 27th took up positions along the west of the 96th Infantry Division's front line, facing Kakazu Ridge. 24th Corps, under General John R. Hodge, now had three divisions engaged instead of two. The 96th was in the center of the line, with the 7th to the east. 
As the American assault against Kakazu Ridge stalled, Lieutenant General Ushijima, influenced by his Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Isamu Chol, decided to take the offensive. On the evening of 12 April, with severely limited illumination under overcast skies, the Japanese 32nd Army attacked American positions across the entire front. Signal flares preceded an intense artillery barrage. In one instance, 200 rounds struck one company's position in 7th Infantry Division's area of operations in just five minutes. The Japanese counterattack was heavy, sustained, and well organized. After fierce close combat, the attackers withdrew, only to repeat their offensive the following night. The Americans were able to repulse the attacks and employ a hasty defense after naval illumination fires finally exposed the Japanese counterattacking forces. These attacks cost the Japanese over 1,600 killed and four captured. The 32nd Army's failed counterattacks led the staff to conclude that the Americans were vulnerable to night infiltration tactics, but superior American firepower made any Japanese offensive operation too costly. Therefore, the Japanese reverted to their defensive strategy. At dawn on 16 April, General Andrew Bruce's 77th Division began landing on the island of Ieshima off the northwest coast of Okinawa. Originally, the capture of Ieshima and the capture of the northern part of Okinawa was scheduled for phase two of the operation, but the Marines' rapid progress in the north encouraged General Buckner to merge phases one and two. Ieshima, like Karamas in the south, contained an additional airfield that could be used to support the assault on Okinawa and future strikes against the Japanese homeland. The Japanese had recognized Ieshima's value and fortified the island between January and March 1945, using approximately 2,000 Japanese troops and hundreds of civilian laborers. The 77th began their amphibious assault on Ieshima using the same techniques previously perfected in the Pacific Theater. Battleships, cruisers, destroyers, and other fire support ships targeted the beaches and aircraft attacked with bombs, rockets, and napalm. Unlike the landings on Okinawa, the Japanese defended some of the beaches on Ieshima, and the Americans met increasing resistance as they advanced on the island. General Bruce requested reinforcements in an attempt to seize the island as quickly as possible, but 10th Army could not provide any. As the rest of 24th Corps was assaulting Kakazu Ridge, the 77th was on its own. The Japanese on Ieshima fought the Americans for every piece of the island. After several days of heavy fighting, the 77th finally secured Ieshima on 21 April. They suffered over 1,000 casualties, including the loss of renowned war correspondent Ernie Pyle, who was killed by enemy machine gun fire on 18 April while on his way to the front. Pyle was buried in the division cemetery on Ieshima under a crude marker, which the division later replaced with a monument. Concurrently, the fight for Kakazu Ridge on Okinawa continued. Following the failed Japanese counterattack and subsequent withdrawal to their next defensive line, General Hodge planned to break through the enemy's defenses around Shuri Castle. He envisioned his troops seizing the low valley and highway extending across the island between Yanabaru and Naha. For this, the 27th Infantry Division served as the supporting effort and attacked into Machinado on 18 April. Minutes after 1600 on 18 April, concealed by artillery smoke, Company G, 106th Infantry Regiment, crossed the estuary in engineer assault boats. The company scaled the cliffs on the other side and cleared the Japanese fighting positions. By midnight, they had erected a 117-meter footbridge and began moving toward the Naha Yanabaru Road. The 7th Infantry Division also supported the effort by seizing Hill 178 
and then advancing down to the Naha Yanabadu Road. The 96th Infantry Division was the main effort and advanced toward the Shuri Line. On 19 April, General Hodge initiated the offensive with a barrage of 324 artillery pieces, the largest ever in the Pacific Theater. U.S. Army artillery fired 19,000 rounds into the enemy's lines in 40 minutes. Battleships, cruisers, and destroyers joined the bombardment, followed by Navy and Marine aircraft attacking the Japanese positions with napalm, rockets, bombs, and machine guns. Yet, the Japanese defenses were positioned on reverse slopes, where the defenders were protected from the Typhoon of Steel emerging to attack the Americans advancing up the forward slope with mortars and grenades. A tank assault by Company A, 193rd Tank Battalion, which included flamethrower-equipped Shermans, attempted to outflank the Japanese forces defending Kakazu Ridge. The company failed to link up with its infantry support and lost 24 tanks in five hours to Japanese anti-tank guns, mines, and suicidal attacks by Japanese soldiers with satchel charges. 24th Corps suffered over 700 casualties in a single day of fighting. The Japanese continued fighting for five days after the Americans' initial attack. But on the evening of 23 April, General Ushijima ordered his severely degraded units to withdraw. During the night of 23-24 April, under heavy fog and cover of artillery fires, the 63rd Brigade 62nd Division evacuated its remaining positions. 24th Corps had secured their L plus 15 objective line, 11 days behind schedule. Both the 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions had been in combat for 25 consecutive days. They needed reconstitution in order to continue offensive operations. Since 3rd Amphibious Corps had largely secured Northern Okinawa, the Marines were able to reinforce the offensive in the south. The 1st Marine Division relieved the 27th Infantry Division, and the 77th Infantry Division relieved the 96th. When the 6th Marine Division arrived, the 3rd Amphibious Corps took over the right flank, and 10th Army assumed command and control of current operations. Reconstitution operations are extraordinary actions that are planned and implemented to restore a unit's combat effectiveness. Reconstitution restores combat power to the levels necessary to maintain endurance and continue operations. Reconstitution is not a sustainment operation, although sustainment plays an integral part. All sustainment functions are executed during reconstitution. Human resources, medical, supply, and maintenance personnel work closely with maneuver forces to rebuild combat power. Reconstitution consists of two major elements, reorganization and regeneration. Reorganization is an expedient cross-leveling of internal resources within an attrited unit in place to restore necessary combat effectiveness and maintain endurance. Regeneration is the intentional restoration of a unit's combat power that requires time and resource-intensive operations, which includes equipment repairs and replacements, supply replenishment, mission essential training, and personnel replacements in accordance with the theater commander's guidance. After the bloody fights at Kakazu and Iishima, 24th Corps was ready to renew the offensive. But as the 96th Infantry Division continued its advance south, it halted to assess the severely restricted terrain to its front. The long, sheer cliff facing the division was the Meta Escarpment, or as the Americans later called it, Hacksaw Ridge. The escarpment runs northeast to southwest, dividing southern Okinawa. Here, the Japanese had prepared complex battle positions to include subterranean positions to halt the American advance. A complex battle position is a defensive location designed to employ a combination of complex terrain and engineer effort, such as camouflage, concealment, cover, and deception, to protect a unit from detection and attack while denying its seizure and occupation by the enemy. A subterranean complex battle position is further defined as a complex battle position with a significant subterranean supporting infrastructure. A threat may integrate subterranean complex battle positions into their main defensive forces for an area defense. 
The additional subterranean component strengthens the durability of the position and limits intelligence collection from the site. Subterranean complex battle positions share many of the same characteristics of complex battle positions, with a couple of additions. These characteristics are as follows. Limited avenues of approach to a subterranean complex battle position. Avenues of approach are easily observable by the defender. 360 degree fire coverage and protection from attack. Engineer efforts, prioritizing camouflage, concealment, cover, deception measures, and counter-mobility efforts to disrupt attacks. Large logistical caches. Sanctuary from which to launch local attacks and counterattacks. Increased survivability. Concealed subterranean facilities hinder the ability of friendly forces to gather accurate damage assessments and other information. On 30 April, the 77th Infantry Division was ready to assume the attack on the Meta Escarpment, and the Japanese met the Americans with over 1,000 rounds of artillery and mortar fire on their frontline positions. Like at Kakazu, the 24th Corps' attack stalled. Even though the 77th made some progress in the center, the 1st Marine Division was halted in the west, and the 7th Infantry Division was stalemated in the east on Kochi Ridge. The defending 62nd Division was at half strength. The Japanese offset this numerical disadvantage by preparing a deliberate defense that took advantage of the forbidding terrain. They held the high ground, compelling U.S. forces to attack uphill. Learning from weeks of tenacious fighting on Okinawa, the U.S. soldiers and Marines modified their tactics. They used heavy weapons to suppress or neutralize small areas and then pushed a small salient into the Japanese lines. They developed new cave fighting tactics and techniques, employing artillery, tanks, and a combination of flamethrowers and explosives to destroy the enemy's complex battle positions. Despite these new tactics and techniques, U.S. forces were only able to make limited progress advancing at Hacksaw Ridge. During one of the most brutal attacks, an Army medic rescued 75 of his wounded comrades. For his actions, Corporal Desmond T. Doss, a conscientious objector, was awarded the Medal of Honor. Facing the collapse of another defensive line, the Japanese leaders disagreed on the potential courses of action. Cho advocated for a large-scale counterattack. Yahara insisted on defensive attrition. Ushijima eventually sided with Cho, convinced that a successful assault targeting American supply lines would be a decisive blow in the battle. The Japanese goal for the second counteroffensive was to destroy the 24th Corps and neutralize the U.S. Navy offshore in a series of coordinated attacks. Ushijima ordered a land attack with amphibious assaults with simultaneous kamikaze and air attacks directed against the fleet. Over the 3rd and 4th of May, Japanese forces sank or damaged 17 ships, inflicted over 600 naval casualties, and bombed shore installations, including Yantan Airfield. On 4 May, the 32nd Army attempted amphibious assaults behind American lines. To support these assaults, Japanese artillery moved out of their caves and into the open. By doing so, they were able to conduct preparatory fires with 13,000 rounds in support. But effective American counterbattery fire destroyed nearly 60 Japanese artillery pieces. The Americans were again able to conduct a hasty defense and defeat the amphibious assault. By midnight on 5 May, Ushijima accepted the fact that his counterattack had failed. The Japanese forces had suffered massive casualties with over 7,000 dead in a matter of hours. The air attack had also cost the Japanese the loss of 131 aircraft. With thousands of casualties and vital ammunition, artillery, and equipment expended in the disastrous counterattack, the Japanese resumed their attritional approach, just as Yahara recommended. By this point in the battle, the Americans had suffered more than 20,000 casualties. Six weeks of nearly continuous fighting resulted in ever-increasing cases of combat fatigue. The American forces had extended their line at Maida, Kochi, and Awacha, thus making their lines of communication 
more secure and gaining more favorable terrain. With these gains, 10th Army launched another offensive on 11 May. Two days later, American troops captured the formidable Nishihara, better known as Conical Hill. Rising 145 meters above the Yanabaru coastal plain, this key terrain was the eastern anchor of the main Japanese defenses and was occupied by about 1,000 Japanese troops. Meanwhile, on the opposite coast, the 1st and 6th Marine Divisions secured Sugarloaf Hill. Capture of these two key positions exposed the Japanese around Shuri Castle on both sides. Estimating that the 32nd Army had expended most of their reserves in the counterattack, Buckner planned to commit all of 10th Army. The area near Shuri Castle is the most rugged terrain in the southern part of the island. Escarpments, steep slopes, and narrow valleys make the major hill masses ideal terrain to establish a strong defense. Here, the Japanese 32nd Army chose to make its stand, meeting the enemy on its own terms in a series of concentric positions where minor infantry actions and anti-tank ambushes would be more successful and American naval fire support less effective. General Buckner planned a double envelopment of Shuri Castle by simultaneously maneuvering around both flanks of Ushijima's force. He designated the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps as the main effort and the 24th Army Corps as the supporting effort. These two corps now made up the 10th Army's front line. The Marines' axis of advance was west of the Shuri Line. The 77th Infantry Division fixed the defending enemy units. The 96th enveloped the Shuri Line from the east. For this operation, artillery employed point fires instead of area fires. The area fires used in earlier engagements were considered to be ineffective by the Americans. The complex Japanese defensive positions required the Americans to change from attacking larger terrain features to small fighting positions. With this new approach, the 10th Army slowly yet methodically destroyed the remaining Japanese defenses of the Shuri Line. Monsoon rains in May slowed the Americans' progress and turned southern Okinawa into a quagmire. The torrential rains and overcast skies also limited 10th Army's ability to observe ongoing operations from the air. Facing a double envelopment of his forces, Ushijima ordered a withdrawal. During the night, the 32nd Army evacuated its wounded and supplies, and signal units started the process of establishing the new headquarters. On 26 May, aerial observers identified large troop movements just below Shuri Castle. At first, Buckner expected the Japanese, without skilled men or adequate transportation or communications, to be hindered by the rain and poor roads, and he planned to take advantage of the retreat. But the rain and mud also affected 10th Army's offensive. The Japanese retreat, although harassed by artillery fire, was conducted with great skill at night. The 32nd Army moved nearly 30,000 personnel into its last defensive line farther south. On 28 May, patrols from the 1st Marine Division found recently abandoned positions. The next morning, the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, occupied the heights east of the foreboding Shuri Castle and reported that it appeared undefended. Shortly afterward, the battalion occupied the fortification, which was outside the 1st Marine Division's assigned area of operations. Only frantic efforts by the commander and staff of the 77th Infantry Division prevented an American air and artillery strike on the castle, which could have resulted in a tragic friendly fire incident. The 77th then moved in to secure the rest of Shuri Castle. The Shuri Line was finally in American hands. Concurrently, from 24 to 27 May, the 6th Marine Division occupied the deserted ruins of Naha, Okinawa's capital and largest city. The Americans now sought the destruction of the 32nd Army. South of Shuri Castle, 
The terrain is rough, but there are a few large escarpments. There are some broad valleys and an extensive road network able to facilitate troop movements. Precipitous limestone cliffs surround an extensive plateau at the southern end of Okinawa. On the northern side of the plateau are two major hills, Yuzadake and Yejudake, which cover and provide visibility of all approaches from the north, east, and west. These peaks were roughly six and a half kilometers from the original front line and had been seen by U.S. troops since the start of the campaign. Here, Ushijima's 32nd Army braced for its final defense. After their withdrawal from Shuri Castle, 11,000 uniformed troops and approximately 22,000 non-uniformed defenders readied themselves along the escarpment. Additionally, there were over 10,000 soldiers and 4,000 sailors at the Imperial Japanese Navy Underground Headquarters near the Okinawa Naval Base. On 4 June, elements of the 6th Marine Division launched an amphibious assault on the peninsula. The majority of the Japanese sailors, including Admiral Minoru Ota, died by suicide within the tunnels of the underground naval headquarters on 13 June. By 17 June, U.S. forces had pushed the remnants of General Ushijima's shattered army into a small pocket in the far south of the island. On 19 June, 10th Army accepted the surrender of 343 soldiers the first mass Japanese surrender of that size in the Second World War. Though the numbers of surrenders greatly increased after 19 June, more than two-thirds of the remaining Japanese defenders chose to die by combat or suicide. At the beginning of June, Japanese casualties had averaged 1,000 per day. By 21 June, that number had risen to 4,000 per day. As the battle drew to a close, American casualties also continued to mount. General Buckner did not live to see the end of the battle for Okinawa. On 18 June, Japanese artillery fire killed Buckner while he monitored 10th Army's progress from a forward observation post. Marine Major General Roy Geiger, now the senior commander, assumed temporary command of 10th Army until Army General Joseph Stilwell arrived in theater five days later. The Americans continued to push the Japanese Army closer to the coast. Rather than face capture, in the early morning of 22 June, General Ushijima and his senior officers gave up the fight and committed seppuku, ritual suicide, outside a cave that faced the sea. Ushijima denied Colonel Yahada's request to commit seppuku, so Yahada could tell the Imperial leaders how the 32nd had defended Okinawa. That same day, 10th Army held a flag-raising ceremony to mark the end of organized resistance on Okinawa. It took seven more days to clear out the last Japanese defenders. On 2 July, 10th Army declared Okinawa secure. 48 days longer than estimated. The official surrender ceremony was held on 7 September near Kadena Airfield. The battle for Okinawa was over. 49,000 American casualties and the brutal fighting that occurred on Okinawa gave military planners great trepidation about Operation Olympic, the planned invasion of the Japanese island of Kyushu. On Okinawa, a single Japanese army, with scarce logistics resupply, negligible air support, and limited reserves, had successfully delayed a significantly larger combined arms force with strong logistics support for nearly three months. Planners predicted U.S. units would have to face an even more adaptive and determined enemy defending Kyushu, and the even more important main island of Honshu. Yet the horrors of the battle for Okinawa did not dissuade the Americans from preparing for Operation Olympic.
What we are trying to do here is wrest back the initiative from the enemy. We must teach the Vietnamese to out guerrilla the guerrillas. What leads us to our rendezvous with destiny in Vietnam is our deep concern with friendly nations everywhere, whenever they face communist subversion and aggression. As they continue their fight, we also help them to build so that they will emerge out of their present struggle a strong and independent member of the free world.